salvation and my strength. The cause of death, they were surrounding me, but he heard my cry for help. He is my refuge, my high tower. He must deliver so strong the servants of death they were surrounding me but he heard my cry for help so I'll stand in trust I'll stand in faith I will not be shaken so I'll stand in trust I'll stand in faith, I will not be shaken. Our God will not, will not be moved. Our God, Our God will never change. Our God will reign forevermore. Oh, our God will not be moved. Our God will never change. Our God will reign forevermore. Oh, our God will not be moved, our God will never change, our God will reign forevermore. So I'll stand in trust, I'll stand in faith, I will not be shaken. So I'll stand in trust, I'll stand in faith. I will not be shaken. They asked old Lazarus, can you explain how a man can be dead then live again? Well, that's just insane. Oh, Lazarus said, boys, I heard a voice, and it spoke life to me, and death set me free. When Jesus called my name, when he called my name, and I heard his voice when he called my name. And I made my choice, and I knew my life would never be the same after he called. He called my name. Well, they asked Zacchaeus, can you tell us about Jesus? In a sycamore tree, he said, I climbed up to see the Lord pass my way. Then the Savior called out, today I'll stay at your house. So I took him in, he forgave all my sin. And he called me by my name when he called my name. And I heard his voice when he called my name. And I made my choice. And I knew my life would never be the same after he called. He called my name. I want to thank God he called October the 27th, 2003, about 9.30 in the morning. Jesus called my name. Maggie came home one day, the raggedy, raggedy Ann. She said, Mama, look what I found in the neighbor's garbage can. It had a missing left arm 
and her right button eye hanging by a thread. She carried it gently up to her room and laid it on her bed with all the other dolls. She loves the broken ones, the ones that need a little patching up. She sees the diamond in the rough and makes it shine like new. It really doesn't take that much, a willing heart and a tender touch. If everybody'd love like Maggie does, there'd be a lot less broken ones. Now, 20 years later, at a shelter on 18th Avenue, a 17-year-old girl shows up all black and blue with needle tracks in her left arm almost too weak to stand she says i'm lost and i need help as maggie takes her hand she says why don't you come on in she loves the broken one the ones that need a little patching up. She sees the diamond in the rough and makes it shine like new. It really doesn't take that much, a willing heart and a tender touch. If everybody loved like she does, there'd be a lot less broken ones. Now, if you called her, an angel, she'd be quick to say to you that she's just doing what the one who died for her would do. Jesus loves the broken ones, the ones that need a little patching up. He sees the diamond in the rough and he makes it shine like new it really doesn't take that much a willing heart and a tender touch if everybody loved like jesus does there'd be a lot less broken ones if everybody loved like jesus does there'd be a lot less broken ones Let's take our Bibles tonight, turn to 1 Kings chapter number 22. 1 Kings chapter number 22. I've only preached this message once or twice, but the Lord laid it on my heart sitting there on the front row. So if I mess it up, I didn't have time to rehearse it, but that's a good chance for the Holy Ghost to show up. Amen. Some of you were asking about my wife, if she was uh, okay. I said, man, she's all right. But the truth is, I'm not sure if she's all right or not, preacher. Uh, my phone rang the other morning. I was out on the front porch, left my phone laying on the counter in the island in the center of the kitchen. And uh, my wife answered my phone, and the fellow on the other line said, I would like to speak to the head hog at the trough. My wife said, well, if you're talking about the pastor, you must address him as pastor. We don't, sir, we don't call him the head hog at the trough. And the man said, well, I was thinking about making a $10,000 donation to the ladies group. She said, hold on, I think Porky's about to walk through the door. <laughs> I said, man, I can't win for losing around here. She was just balled out that fast. Let's stand together. You'll be sitting, how long do I have, preacher? 35, 40 minutes? Are we good to go with that? We started at 6.30, so we get an extra 30 minutes, right? I feel good. I feel like I'm at home here. Y'all laughing and smiling, acting like you love church. A lot of churches I go to, I think they just feel like they have to be there or they're going to go to hell. Um, Y'all act like you enjoy this place. I like it. That's the way it is at sunrise too. All right, 1 Kings chapter 22, one verse, verse number eight. We'll have a word of prayer and I'm going to bring you the message the Lord's laid on my heart. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. Watch this. But I hate him. <laughs> Don't you love your King James Bible? Amen. Said, I hate that dude. Why? For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, 
but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I love you tonight. Thank you for this grand opportunity to be in the house of God. Thank you for Brother Jason, Miss Tiffany. Thank you for this good group of people. I pray that tonight you'd help me to preach what thus saith the Lord. These people did not come to see my personality. They did not come to hear from man. They come to hear from Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So God, we lift up the blood of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, up against all the devils of hell, the gloom, doom, doubt, defeat, division, destruction, all the spiritual wickedness that may be going on in high places. I pray that you kick the devils of hell off this hill, give your children a space of grace to receive the word of God, walk these aisles in an old-fashioned way, roll up your sleeve, flex your strong arm, brandish your sword, God. I pray that you look past our faults and see our needs tonight, overshadow this place, hedge us in, let the glorious light of Jesus Christ outshine the darkness. Lord, roll back the curtain of memory in our minds. Remind us of where we came from. Give us a glimpse of where we're heading. I pray you to anoint this place from top to bottom and front to back. God, we need you like the very air that's in our lungs, like the heartbeat that's in our chest. No law but love, no creed but Christ, no price but the blood, and no book but the Bible. Help your people save souls. Charge us, change us, and challenge us. In the name of Jesus Christ, I publicly admit I can do nothing without the help of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, and you can have a seat. This is a story, many of you have read it, some of you may not be familiar with it, and so before I give you my main thought, I want to just kind of give you some background on where this story comes from. This story entails uh, two kings and one man of God. The man of God, his name is Micaiah. Micaiah is the preacher man. Micaiah means like Jehovah. That's what his name means. Um, so here's the odds. Micaiah is outnumbered 400 to 1. As the curtain rises in this scene, Ahab, king of Israel, and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, have joined forces to fight against the Syrians and take back Ramoth-Gilead. The Syrians had taken Ramoth-Gilead from Ahab's father. Jehoshaphat has already made a mistake. He has went to Ahab and it almost cost him his life, but he says to Ahab, the most wicked king in the history of Israel, he says, I am as you are. My people are as your people. I want us to work together. And so Jehoshaphat becomes a compromiser. He knows God, but he decides to mix with the unruly uh, rulers of Israel, the ungodly rulers of Israel to get more accomplished. Now listen to me. When you start yoking up with unbelievers so that you can get more accomplished, you're heading down a dead end street. So he becomes a compromiser. So before they go to war, he says, well, maybe we should check and see what God says about this deal. That's a pretty good idea, wouldn't you say? And so Ahab says, don't worry about that. I've already talked to my preachers. I've got 400 of them. I pay them well. They tickle my ears. They tell me everything that I want to hear. And so Ahab says, my preacher said, I'm going to be victorious. I'm going to prosper. All is well. They've got three points and a poem at the end, and everything's going to turn out all right. Jehoshaphat says, Ahab, don't you have any independent, fundamental, King James, Bible-believing, hell-hating, sin-hating, Jesus? Jesus loving, nana pudding eating, offering taken, window shaking, biscuit baking, Baptist around here. That'll tell us the truth. That'll pin their ears back. Whether we like it, lump it, bump it, or jump it, shout, pout, or pass out, take it across the street and dump it out. Just preach the hide off of our walls. Hey, Ahab, don't you have anybody willing to preach the truth? Whether we like it or not, well, King Ahab says, there's this one man, there's this one preacher, but I hate his guts. I hate him. Hate him. His name is Micaiah. His name means like Jehovah. And he ain't never got anything good to say about me. And that's because there was never anything good to say about Ahab or Jezebel, his wife. So Ahab tells his messengers to go get Micaiah, the preacher man. Go get that leather lung preacher. And while they're waiting on Micaiah to show up, 
Zedekiah, the head of the 400 false prophets, says to these two kings, we'd like to do a little drama for you while we're waiting on Micaiah. And so he makes horns of iron. Go home and read this chapter. It's wonderful. So he makes horns of iron. He puts on this theatrical performance. It's so lovely and fuzzy and cozy. They got black lights and dancing girls and, and spandex and neons and heavy metal guitars. And Zedekiah says to Ahab, everything's going to be all right. Don't worry. Be happy, man. Everything's all right. Maybe he says that preacher that's on his way, he's behind the times, man. He's against everything. Why, he's even against us and our bell worship. And so the messenger gets to Micaiah. He says, listen, Micaiah, the king back there, the king of Israel and the king of Judah are together now, and they're requesting your presence but listen to me, don't rock the boat. Everything's going fine. We've already told him that everything's going to turn out good. Nothing to worry about. Uh, listen, just agree with the ministerial association today. Don't, don't rock against the association, please. Uh, just let us have a good time. All is well. Uh, listen, don't, don't go in there with thus saith the Lord and the word of God and all that. Micaiah, can you please just let us have a good day today? But Micaiah says... Whatever God tells me to tell those kings, I'm going to tell them. Micaiah is not a rubber stamp. He's not bought out. He's not persuaded by liberal compromisers. He's not a hireling. And so he comes before King Ahab and King Jehoshaphat. At first, Micaiah is sarcastic. Go home and read it. He says to the king, well, just go ahead, king. You've already made up your mind. Go ahead. You'll be all right. Ahab says, see, I told you. He's not on our side. He's sarcastic. Then a lying spirit, the Bible says, falls on the false prophets and they convince Ahab to go on and fight anyway. And so Micaiah, the preacher man, is outnumbered and he's hated for truth. But he tells Ahab, here's what he says, if you go up against Syria today, you're going to fall, you're going to die. God is not in this, Ahab. He's not in it. So Micaiah ends up persecuted and imprisoned for the truth. Zedekiah is very offended at Micaiah's message. And here's what the Bible says. Zedekiah looks at that man of God, rears back and smacks him right on the face. And here's what he says. He smacks him on the face and says, which way went the spirit of the Lord from me to you today? Micaiah looks at him and says, you'll find out one day who's right. And you'll find out one day who's wrong. Listen, time out. This world, this, this generation that we're living in is smacking you and I on the face. And they're making fun of Jesus is coming back. And they're making fun of Sunday morning worship. And they're making fun of reading your Bible and tithing and supporting your pastor and supporting your church and living right. They're making fun of you if you don't agree with men with men and women with women. They're making fun of you if you disagree with legalizing drugs and alcohol. They, listen, they're, they're smacking you on the face and saying, which way went the Spirit of God today? Can I tell you, God's going to show up and vindicate His people. There's coming a day when every knee's going to bow, every tongue's going to confess, and church of the living God, you're doing right. God's going to show up and get us out of this mess. He's going to come back and rule and reign with a rod of iron. And listen, Oprah Windbag's going to bow. Madame O'Hara is going to bow. Charles Darwin is going to bow. Obama and Hillary and Bill is going to bow. Joe Biden is going to bow. The liberals are going to bow. Nancy Pelosi is going to bow. Everyone's going to bow. I'd rather bow now than be at the great white throne and have to bow. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And you'll live for eternity in a lake of fire and brimstone. They're giving us a hard time right now. They're smacking us on the face, but there's coming a day, baby. There's coming a day. Y'all just keep holding on. You're doing right. So Micaiah is outnumbered. He just got smacked on the face. He says, you're going to find out one day who's right and who's wrong. Ahab says, put Micaiah in prison. Shut him up. I'm tired of that negative preaching. And so the preacher man, Micaiah, is in prison. But he says something to Ahab. Here's what he says. He says, if you survive this battle, king, then I'm a liar and I'm wrong. And we're going to know that those false prophets are right. But if you die, in this battle, then everyone's going to know that I was preaching the truth. Amen. He just put God to the test. He looked at that king after being smacked in the face, ridiculed, put in prison. He said, I'm going to tell you something, king. 
If you die in this battle, you let it, everybody's going to know that the preacher man was right. So Israel and Judah join forces. They go to fight against Ramoth Gilead. They go to fight against the Syrians. I think Ahab had a little bit of a hunch that Micaiah was right because before he went to battle, he disguised himself. I wonder why he did that. The Syrians thought Jehoshaphat was Ahab. And so Jehoshaphat yells out, Hey, I'm not Ahab. Don't kill me. Then an Assyrian drew an arrow at a venture and shot his bow. But it smote King Ahab. He said, Carry me from the battle for I am wounded. And he bled to death in his chariot that day. And the dogs came and licked his blood just like God prophesied when he stole Naboth's vineyard. Here's my message. The preacher was right. That's my message, preacher. The preacher man, God's man, was right. I'm preaching for a few minutes on the preacher was right. How about Noah? He said, it's going to rain. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. He was a preacher of righteousness. Uh, But one day, listen to me, the grounds broke open. uh, The the earth began to uh, shoot forth the waters, uh, and the water began to rise and rise and rise. Uh, And mom and dad said, I don't know what's going on. Maybe that preacher was right. Uh, Oh, no, just disguise it. Uh, uh, Just forget about it. No, keep on going. Keep on living the way you want to, marrying and drinking and eating and giving in marriage. Uh, But then the water began to rise higher and higher and higher. Uh, And then they begin to doggy paddle and tread water. Next thing you know, they're trying to beat on the ark. Noah, open up the door, Noah. But the day of grace was over. Noah couldn't open that door because God shut it. Can I tell you something? The preacher was right. Joseph was right when his dreams come to pass. Elijah was right when he uh, he told Ahab earlier, it's not going to rain until I say so. And when you've been standing before God, you can stand before kings. There was three and a half years of drought. Why? Because the preacher was right. Jeremiah was right. He said there'll be 70 years of captivity. And honey, the preacher was right. Daniel was right. He prophesied the Messiah riding into Jerusalem after 70 weeks, 483 years from the time that they started to rebuild Jerusalem, the Messiah will present himself. Listen, Daniel was right. The preacher man was right. Jesus was right. He said destroy this temple. In three days, I'll raise it up. And can I tell you, Jesus was right. The preacher man was right. And can I tell you something tonight, church? Micaiah had a great uh, opportunity to make it big and make lots of money. He's got an audience of 400 preachers and two kings. All he has to do is walk up to those two kings and those 400 preachers and tell them what they wanted to hear. Oh, he would have been, he would have had the gold chain put around his neck. He would have been given a ring. He would have been given riches and gold and silver and gorgeous attire to put on and and all the honor and prestige and pomp. This man had a chance to have it made. All he had to do was forget about what God had to say and tell them what they wanted to hear. But this man of God was on a mission. He wasn't worried about their parsonage or their paycheck or a pat on the back. He said that whatever God tells me to preach, I I'm going to preach it. Thank God for some preachers who will preach the truth. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Come on. Preach on. John the Baptist come out of the wilderness preaching. The Bible said he had locust and honey. What's that all about? An unjust balance is an abomination. He got locust. Locust is a picture of sin. It devours. He's preaching against sin in one hand, and he's got a jar of honey in the other hand, saying, listen, you don't have to die and go to hell. The wages of sin is death. But a man named Jesus is on his way. He's down there baptizing a generation of vipers. He said, not only are you a snake, but your daddy's a snake and your granddaddy's a snake. Hey, show me fruit meat for repentance. Who told you to flee from the wrath to come? Locust, locust, locust. Hold on a minute. Behold. Oh, the Lamb of God was taken away, the sin of the world. You know what he was doing? He was preaching a just balance of sin and sweetness. Preachers don't hate people. If we did, we'd never tell them to flee from the wrath to come. We love people. We know what sin does to a marriage and a teenager and We know what pornography does to a man or a woman. We know what alcohol does to you. We know what marijuana and dope and all that stuff. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, he said, preacher, you can't tell me smoking marijuana is wrong because God made the marijuana plant. 
You heard that? I looked down at the preacher. I said, well, God made poison ivy too. Smoke some, moron. <laughs> Just because God made it don't mean he wants you snorting it or smoking it or drinking it or eating it. God made fire ants. Snort a line of them. God made them. <laughs> Amen. Preacher was right. Preacher will always be right if he keep, preaches that Bible. Preacher man was right. Hey, the preacher was right when he told me sin will take you further and keep you longer. I grew up in church. I grew up in a church like this, man, where the preacher would preach. I was raised at Greer Baptist Camp Meeting and Blue Ridge Camp Meeting, Harold Seitler, Billy Kelly, Mays Jackson, Sammy Allen, Billy Canoy, some of the greatest men of God were friends of my family. Sign my Bible. Man of God told me for many years growing up in the house of God, stay away from sin. It'll take you further, keep you longer, make you pay more than you ever dreamed of. But at the age of 17 and a half years old, I decided to do things my way on the backside of a mall parking lot in uh, Morgantown, Pennsylvania in a 1986 Camaro, having a hard time with a girlfriend. Popped open the top of a fifth of Jack Daniels, uh, poured liquid fire down my throat, lit up a Marlboro, uh, and put in some rock and roll music. Uh, and can I tell you something, young people? It felt good. Don't lie to your kids. There's pleasure in sin. For a season. I said, man, that sure did feel good. Went home, hid the bottle. Thought I got away with it the next day. I said, well, there's a little bit more in that bottle. I'll finish it off. And the next day I got another bottle. And then I was turned on to a, a drug called oxycodone. Five milligrams did pretty good for a while. Then I needed 10, then 20, then 40, then 80, then Oxycontin. Then I was turned on to cocaine in Reading, Pennsylvania at the age of 18 years old. And 13 years after popping the top on the fifth of Jack Daniels, I've got tattoos all over my body, riding with the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, needle tracks in my arms, whiskey on my breath, half drunk, hollow eyed, whiskey bent, hell bound. I was gonna make a big splash in the lake of fire on a Harley Davidson and impress the devil. That's how foolish I had become. Can I tell you something? The preacher was right. Sin took me further and kept me longer and made me pay a whole lot more than I ever dreamed of. The preacher was right, boys. He was right. I woke up in the Hells Angels Clubhouse after being up for four days straight on methamphetamines and heroin. 13 years of pushing needles in my arms. I had a ponytail down to my belt. My entire body's covered with tattoos. Hell's Angels colors tattooed on my back, top rocker, bottom rocker, and center patch in the middle. I'd been up for four days dealing dope, had not ate, had not slept, done nothing but speedball for four days. Passed out for two hours in a Hell's Angels clubhouse. Woke up thinking, my God, how did I get here? I said, God, how did I get here so far away from the truth? And God rolled my mind back to the age of 17 and a half years old. He said, I tried to tell you. The preacher was right, boy. It took you further and kept you longer, didn't it? And the preacher was right. He was right. Found myself a shell of a man, eat up with devils and demons, doing things I never thought I'd do. My wife was on the brink of leaving me, had two beautiful children. Cody was 10, Alexis was two years old. I was doing everything I could to destroy my family. Teach my, my son was already drinking homemade muscadine wine and stealing cigarettes from the IGA at 10 years old. He already knew how to cuss, fight, steal. I thought I was turning him into a man. I'll never forget I'll never forget coming home that Sunday morning. I met my wife at the four-way stop sign. All of a sudden, she began to scream at me from her heart. Honey, where have you been? I don't even know who you are anymore. They're about to come repossess the house and the car. You're out wasting every dime we have on wine and women and song. The kids are hungry. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Our son Cody was 10 years old that morning. He looked through the front windshield and as if to say, Daddy, Mama goes to bed crying every night. Me and little sister, we're scared. We need you, Dad. 
We need a functional home. Dad, when are you going to come home and be a dad to me? Our little girl was two years old. She began to try to look from around the front seat in a little car seat, a little Sunday dress on. My wife was going to church. I'm coming home from a four-day high. My little girl began to scream from her heart, Daddy, it won't be long. I'll belong to one of them boys down there at the clubhouse. They'll pass me around and and I'll be a tramp and I'll have STDs and children out of wedlock. And Hey, Dad, there's nothing you can do about it because you're teaching me that's the way of life. Right. And the light turned green. And God began to tell me the preacher was right, boy. The preacher was right. Look at your family. Look at your life. I want you to know the preacher was right when he said sin will take you further and keep you longer. But then the preacher was right when he told me sin leaves scars in your mind and your body. Sin leaves scars in your mind and your body. Oh yeah, Jesus is always there to save you when you're ready to come to him. And I get that, but can I tell you something? Some of the things I got to deal with in my mind, some of the things I got to look at on my body are things I wish to God I could go. I told my wife the other day, I said, if I could pay somebody $100,000 to just make every tattoo on my body disappear, I'd give every dime I have and take a loan from the bank to just get them gone. I hate the fact that when I take my shirt off and my wife has to look at me, she sees all those wicked symbols and gang signs on my shoulders and my chest and my back. I wish I could get rid of them. These scars above my eye and on my head where I've been shot and stabbed had a Budweiser bottle busted above my left eye. I wish I could get rid of the memories of Christmas morning 2002 when I come out of the bedroom and the video camera was rolling and the motorcycles were idling in the front yard and my two beautiful children and my lovely wife were sitting around the Christmas tree waiting on daddy to get up and all I was worried about was another shot of heroin and another good time with the hell's angels and you can see daddy walking through the living room with his eyes bloodshot. I said I'm going off for a little while well, y'all have fun around the Christmas tree. I'll be back sometime this evening. I had to go get a fix and left my family around. The- I wish to God I could go back and get that out of my mind. But the preacher was right when he said sin will scar your mind and leave marks in your life that you wish you could get rid of. The very fact that a man overdosed in a bar bathroom floor, we had to kick the door in and take him to the hospital where he died because of the dope that I had sold him. He shot it up in his arms 30 minutes after I sold it to him and I'm thinking Paul is in hell he's dead and in hell because I sold him the dope you don't want to carry that bondage around boys preacher was right when he said sin leaves scars in your mind and in your body but can I tell you the preacher was right when he said Jesus will leave the 90 and 9 to search for the one that's gone astray (laughs) I'm glad the preacher was right when he preached on the prodigal. He said there was a boy who wanted all of his substance to him and he went to a far country and he wasted on a riotous living and he feigned, he found himself in a hog pen and he fain would have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. But he came to himself and he said I will arise and go to my father. I'm glad Jesus said there was a great shepherd who left the 99 who went after the one that had gone astray. It's See, that morning I met my wife at that intersection. I drove three miles on a 1999 Harley Davidson fat boy with 21 inch ape hangers. Hey, listen, I rolled the throttle back, rolled into the house, crawled through the living room, locked the bathroom door, laid down on a cold linoleum floor, and said, God, I can't break free. I can't get out of this mess. Right. Hell's Angels Coalition members have told me if I ever tried to get out of the club, They take a blowtorch to my back because of the tattoos that's on my back this very moment. I said, God, I can't get out of the club and I can't get off with the dope. Every time I try to put the heroin and the methadone down, my body locks down on me. God, where are you? And the Holy Ghost said, hold on, son. Help is on the way. 
That great shepherd was on a mission. He didn't left the 99 looking for that one boy. I don't know how you interpret it, but honey, I know that God came looking for me. I wasn't looking for him. I was looking for another good time. But you can't stop mama and daddy from praying. You can't stop grandma and grandpa from sicking the hounds of heaven on your heels. You can't stop a loving God from putting the Holy Ghost on you. Hey, you know what I found out, boys? The Holy Ghost ain't scared of a bar room. Holy Ghost ain't scared of a meth lab. The Holy Ghost ain't scared of a Hell's Angels clubhouse. How do you know, preacher? Because he followed me everywhere I went for eight days. I tried the crack house, the meth lab, the tattoo parlor, the clubhouse, the bar room, the pool hall. I even tried to go out back with bloody knuckles and beat somebody half to death just to feel good. But the Holy Ghost was on my heels. Everywhere I went, all I could see was the preacher saying, the wages of sin is death, boy. You're going to fry like fat back in hell if you don't get saved. I found out the preacher was right when he said that sin will take you further. And sin leaves scars in your mind and your body. But Jesus will leave the 90 and 9 to search for the one that's gone astray. Uh, eight days after seeing my wife at that intersection, I woke up on a Monday morning, October the 27th, 2003, under Holy Ghost conviction. Got up out of the bed, looked up on my gun cabinet in that King James Bible my dad had given me back when I was about 10 years old. Uh, Harold Seitler done signed it and all them men of God. Uh, I looked at it that day, and for the first time in many, 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 many years, uh, there was a spotlight from heaven on that Bible. I picked it up, brushed the dust off of it, Walked into the bathroom, laid it on the counter, looked in the mirror, and I said, there's got to be more to life than what I'm living. I'd rather die and go to heaven than live in hell on this earth anymore. And at that moment, I turned away from the mirror to call my mom and dad. And I believe that's when I got saved because that's when my heart was turning to Jesus Christ. I picked up the phone. I said, Mom, there's something bad wrong with me. Mom, she's watching tonight. She's watching me every night of my life. She hung up the phone on me. I said, now you know you're in bad shape when Mama hangs up on you. I stood there, I don't know how long, and I walked into the living room, and I heard the back door opening. It was my mom and dad coming home, coming over from next door. It's a 30-yard trail through the woods out in the country where we lived. Mama was out stepping daddy with that blood red back King James Bible tear stained pages tucked up under her arm. She said, boy, you're a sinner. You're going to die and go to hell if you don't get saved. I said, mama, I know right there on the couch, my mother began to read to me the, the Romans road. Here's what she said. She said, boy, the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I said, mama, I'm so short of God's glory. Step two, please. She said, the Bible says that the wages, the wages of sin is death. Do you believe that, boy? I said, Mama, I'm almost dead. Get to the good part. She goes, she said, I'm glad you asked, boy. Here's what the Bible says about your condition. Right now, you listen to me. My dad and my wife and our little girl standing over against the wall. Cody was in school that morning. They're just standing there staring like, what in the world is going on here? Mama looked at me. She said, but some of the best words I've ever heard. Of my Sounded better than Leonard Skinner. Bob Seeger, <laughs> son of better Metallica and Led Zeppelin all put together. She said, but God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know what was happening? The preacher was right. He, he was searching out that one that gone astray. She said, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in that heart, God will raise him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. She looked over at me to see if I was ready to get saved. I was already on my face saying, God, if you're as real as that Bible says you are, you can save me. Save my soul. Forgive me of my sins. You say, preacher, what happened to you that morning? I went down a beggar, baby, come up a millionaire, about 10 gallons of galvanized glory come down to my soul. I got saved by the grace of God. And the preacher was right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyone who calls upon him shall be saved. Amen. The preacher was right when he said sin will take you further and keep you longer. The preacher was right when he said sin leaves scars in your mind and your body. The preacher was right when he said Jesus will leave the 90 and 9 and search for the one that's gone astray. And lastly, the preacher was right when he said God will restore the years that the locust and the canker worm and the palmer worm and the northern army 
have destroyed. I got saved going on 20 years ago. I got saved on a Monday. And that morning, about 9.30 that night, that evening I walked next door. I said, Mom, I got to get out of the club. She said, I know I've been praying for you. What are you going to do? I said, well, I can be a wimp and I can mail my colors in or I can send them in by one of the boys or I can mail them in or I can go in there Friday night, go ahead and get it over with and not look over my shoulder the rest of my life. My mom looked at me. She said, oh, son, you're going in there, aren't you? I said, yeah, Mom, I ain't going to look over my shoulder the rest of my life. I said, they're going to do what they're going to do anyhow. They'll, sit, they'll catch up to you. Mom goes, Mm. I'm going with you. <laughs> She's watching. I said, Mom, moms don't go with sons to get out of motorcycle gangs. You're going to get us killed. She said, you listen to me, boy. I'm the mama. You're the son. I tell you what to do. You don't tell me what to do. I'm going with you. I said, Dad, do something with your wife. She's going to get us killed. Mama got carpet burn on her bottom lip. She said, Ephesians chapter 5, I've got to submit to him. Okay, well, that means I can't go. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to fast and pray till you come home Friday night. I'm not going to eat a bite till you come home. I said, amen, you can do that. Amen. Make a long story short, God began to restore the years. Walked in on a Friday night into a meeting room in a clubhouse full of grown men where there was brass knuckles chains and pipes and revolvers laying on the table. I walked in there and laid my colors on the table. The boss man said, you got something to tell us? I said, I can't ride with you no more. He said, you want to tell us why? You said you give your life for this club. I said, I got saved Monday morning. He said, saved from what? I said, I'm glad you asked. I said, I got saved from my sin. I said, I know y'all don't understand this and you ain't going to get it. I said, but I decided to follow Jesus Christ the rest of my life. And because I'm going to follow him, I can't follow you. I said, do what you got to do and get it over with quickly. Things were going pretty good. They don't want to hurt me. I, them boys loved me. Asked me a few questions about the tattoo. Said, will you get it covered up? I said, that's better than a blowtorch. This one guy stood up. I said, man, here we go. He started to open his mouth, but he could not get the words out of his mouth. He began to stutter. Uh, 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 uh. He's looking at me. I'm looking at him. Everybody's looking at me, and I'm going, Mama, don't eat yet. <laughs> I ain't out of here yet. That boy looked around, stared at the table, and sat down like he was in a daze. Say, Preacher, what was going on? God was restoring the years. God said, if you're crazy enough to walk into a den of lions ready to devour you. I will shut the mouths of the lions in the name of Jesus. I walked out a free man. A year later, I'm off of tobacco, methadone, out of the club. Two years after the Lord saved me, my pastor walked up to me. I'm done, preacher. I've done preached long enough. My pastor walked up to me. He said, Brother Barry, we need a youth group leader. Our youth pastor moved across town. You've been saved two years. You've shown a lot of fruit. How would you feel about becoming the youth pastor? I said, me? A youth pastor? I said, yeah, I'll do that. My wife and I, we treated it like a church full of 5,000 people. After I was saved for four and a half years, God called me to start a church in Lugolf, South Carolina, Sunrise Baptist Church with eight people. We just moved into a debt-free new building that seats almost 500, Amen. running about 200 on Sunday morning. To God be the glory. My marriage is stronger than it's ever been. I'm so in love with my wife. She's texting me right now. My phone's vibrating. She's telling me how much she loves me. Can't wait for me to get home. I know she does it every time I preach. She calls me at 6 o'clock every night of my life. Are you there yet? What kind of church is it? Is it pretty? Tell me about the flowers. Tell me about the paint colors. My marriage is stronger than it's ever been. I love my children. We're not perfect, but we're doing our best to carry the gospel message. Say, preacher, what are you saying? The preacher was right when he said God will restore the years that the locust and the cankerworm have devoured. I don't know where you're at 
in that series of events. Hopefully, young people, you never go into sin, because I promise you, you'll wish to God you never had. Amen. You don't need a testimony like mine, because for every Barry Spears that makes it out, I can take you to at least a hundred tombstones that say, rest in peace. I don't know why God spared me. There's people, listen, I've gone to funerals of people who did a whole lot less dope than I did that died of overdoses. Did a whole lot more fentanyl or less fentanyl than I did and died from it. I don't know where you're at in that series of events, but maybe you need this truth in your life. The preacher is right when he says sin will take you further. The preacher is right when he says it leaves scars on your mind and your body. The preacher's right when he says Jesus will leave the 90 and 9 and search for the one that's gone astray. Maybe you're that one tonight. But then maybe you need God to restore the years that sin has devoured from your life. I'm going on 20 years this October. And I promise you the preacher was right. God, by, listen, his faithfulness, given me the strength to stay faithful every day. He has restored my mind. The doctors told me, preacher, the methadone clinic doctor, he told me, he said, you'll never, you'll never live a sober life. You'll always need something to level out the chemistry in your brain. Your serotonin levels, your dopamine levels are messed up from the floor up. You'll never live a sober, you'll always need some type of supplement. Can I tell you something that was 20 years ago? And God has restored my mind. I know y'all think I'm crazy, but you should have seen me 20 years ago. You think I'm crazy now. God wants to restore your life, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done. I'm telling you, this preacher's right. Stand with me, heads are bowed on. It is a joy and a privilege to be able to know that you've tuned in, and I pray that today that the word of God that was shared will be a blessing to you. If somehow, some way that the Lord has spoke to your heart, and maybe you're uh, sitting where you are and you don't know for sure that you're saved by the grace of God and you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, then I want you to know that the Word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it very plain, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, how do I get saved? You have to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Repent of your sin and then know as the Bible says where Jesus says, I am the way. And I pray that today that that will be your desire to be able to seek out for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to trust him as a Lord and Savior. If you do that today and you repent of your sins and you take him as your Savior, would you do us a favor and contact our church office at 336-788-0551? We would love to be able to speak with you. We would love to be able to encourage you, maybe be able to help you find a local church no matter where you are today, and maybe even possibly disciple you. So we want to say thank you so much, and we are definitely going to be praying for you and this ministry that our church has. If you know you're saved and maybe the Lord spoke to you in a different way and there's something heavy on your heart, again, that same number, if you can contact us, we'll be so thankful to be able to reach out and be able to speak with you. But again, on behalf of the church and myself, thank you so much and may God bless you.